Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Top Hat Gaming Man, the show where I treat all of my adoring watchers and glorious patrons to sample some of the fine wines of gaming, many of which I currently keep stored in my Scrooge McDuck style gaming vault. Yeah. In today's episode, I am going to be discussing the origins of one of my all-time favourite franchises. It is everyone's favourite Japanese waifu series, Fire Emblem. This is a game which at the time pushed the capabilities of the Famicom further than any other game of the time. A game that was such a huge step away from the usual light-hearted child-orientated games of the time which as a result would sadly mean that the game would not perform so well on release. Over the years though, the Fire Emblem franchise has slowly built from strength to strength, becoming a Nintendo staple in the years to come. Before I go into rambling about Nintendo's distant past, I am going to take you back to just a few years ago. Back to 2002, the era of the GameCube, which I might quickly add is not a retro gaming console, due to the fact there has been no significant paradigm shift in gameplay or graphics between the GameCube and the modern era. Nintendo games are pretty much the same today as they were in 2002, nothing's changed! Anyway, amongst the GameCube's library was Super Smash Bros. Meal. This was one game I rushed out to purchase on launch, and so must so many of other people, bearing in mind that it was the best selling game on the cube. With Meal, I loved the variety of all the classic Nintendo characters and the fact you could pick your favourite and use them to utterly destroy other characters, from brands you wouldn't have even thought you'd ever see together on one screen. You had your classics like Mario, Link and Kirby, but then you also had a few other characters make appearances that I'd never seen before. This was my first introduction to the likes of Marth and Roy. I suppose my first reaction to seeing these two characters were, oh, I haven't got a clue who these dapper chaps are. I'd heard they were from some RPG, but I don't actually remember where I heard that information. You need to remember, this is England. Nintendo fanboys were a rarity in my life until the invention of YouTube and hipsters. Most people grew up with master systems or microcomputers. It wasn't until much later in time that a false Nintendo nostalgia embedded itself into local popular culture. This was when silly youngsters began to believe that the NES was actually popular here. <laughs> Anyway, moaning about Me Too cultures aside, I eventually obtained one of the Fire Emblem games on the GBA. The franchise finally saw a release in the West due to the popular demand for the series generated by Smash. I remember initially thinking, oh, it's a strategy RPG, like a rip-off of Advance Wars. To be fair, I wasn't that impressed at the time as I was hoping for something more Final Fantasy-like. However, the game's charm and playstyle soon grew on me. In fact, I've become such a big fan of the series that I've nearly played them all now. I've even purchased Fire Emblem Warriors on the Switch too. And despite all of this though, I've never actually played the first game. That is of course until now, Fire Emblem on the Famicom. Known in Japan as, now forgive me for my usual butchering of the Japanese language, Ryu to Hikari no Tsurugi, which translates as Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light. Fire Emblem was released in Japan on the 20th of April 1990. It was co-developed by Intelligent Systems and Nintendo's Research and Development 1 department. Intelligent Systems were responsible for creating classic Nintendo titles such as Wild Gunman and Metroid, whereas the Nintendo Research and Development team had fingers in pretty much every Nintendo pie going at that point, including many of the arcade games such as Donkey Kong and Mario Brothers, which I spoke about in a very recent video of mine. Development for this began three years prior to its release, in 1987, and was conceived by Shozu Kaga, again if I'm pronouncing that right. 
He sought inspiration from the strategic elements of the Famicom exclusive Famicom Wars, which would explain the Advance Wars link, with RPG elements including character development and story. It was directed by Kazuki Terasaki and one of the darlings of this channel, Gunpei Yokoi. He produced the game. The scale of the game meant that the team needed to find ways around memory storage problems and made compromises with the graphics and storyline. They used a memory chip called an MMC3, which basically offered a whopping one megabyte of memory. So, it was an upgrade from the usual memory used. However, it still falls to production staff to cut out certain cutscenes etc which used up technically unnecessary space. Don't ask me what an MMC3 actually is though by the way, because that's far too technical for me. That's the sort of information only true pencil neck nerds and dweebs are interested in, and I'm certainly not one of those. The story in this game sets up for what you would now come to expect from the games in this franchise, so for those who have yet to play this game, I shan't give away any storyline spoilers. All I will say to you though is the story will start out with a small party, which includes the iconic hero King Marth, Cider, not to be confused with the alcoholic beverage, and a few others. The characters must journey across the continent of Arcania. They gain allies to join their fight as well along the way. Each character is likeable and each have their own story, even if small, which means you'll end up with some kind of attachment to them. You'll actually care about the characters and their trials and tribulations. You'll actually want them to succeed, which makes them a lot more endearing than me, I suppose, considering the amount of abuse I get in my comment section sometimes. <laughs> By the way, don't forget to donate to me on Patreon. If, like me, you have played some of the newer titles, you'll see that a lot of what was created in this original game has remained in the series ever since. Things from the job classes, weapon choices, legendary weapons like the Falchion will make appearances in virtually every other game after, or at the very least get mentioned. Even the shop music remains the same. It is also amazing hearing the Famicom versions of songs which I'd only heard orchestrally before. One of the most important and notable things that sets this game aside from the newer titles is the fact that if any characters die in battle, they die permanently. This can be very frustrating because this is genuinely something you don't come across in gaming much nowadays. You spend all your time nurturing and levelling up characters, following their stories only for them to die and not come back. And don't anyone compare this to Aerith from Final Fantasy VII. This is much bigger. These characters are actually likeable, rather than just two-dimensional boring polygon tarts. In some of the Fire Emblem games I have played, I found myself time and again hitting the reset button on my console just so I can go back and redo the battle. I suppose a positive vote would be that it forces you to really think about your strategy. Which character you send to the armory, which character you send to fight which enemy. Can you use two on one? Can any fight from a distance? This is definitely a game for those with a little brain power. Dimwits won't be able to handle a game like this, which is probably why it never saw a release in America at the time. Sorry Yankees, that joke was just too easy. There are some other subtle differences too. The blue and red tile movement range wasn't an original concept. You had to move the cursor to work out where your character can move to. There are only four weapon slash item slots and no abilities to trade. This means if your character is already holding four items, they cannot take any more nor purchase anything at the shop. Though they can give items to another character if they have room and you can also store items in a tent. At a cost of 10 gold for doing so that is. The healing characters, such as the clerics, can't gain any experience unless they're attacked by enemies, which as you can imagine, makes them even more vulnerable to having your party. There are other differences too, but the most significant is that there is no weapon triangles in this game. When you strategize, you don't have the ability to use red weapons against green weapons against blue weapons. Instead, most weapons have their own traits, for example axes are powerful 
powerful, but more likely to miss. Swords, on the other hand, are more accurate, but less powerful. There is still the class change feature, but it's not as developed as the games created after. For example, Marth cannot change his class, Pegasus Knights, class change to Dragon Knights, and Knights, Hunters, Fighters and Thiefs cannot change either. As I mentioned above, the team working on this title really pushed the system's capabilities with this game. For the time, this game was visually stunning. The sprites on the screen haven't changed too much in the follow-up games either. The actual battle screens are much simpler though. For example, they have a plain black background with only your sprite and the enemy sprite visible. You can see them actually attack each other, though it's not as realistic looking as the modern games. However, it's still impressive for the time. One thing I will comment on though is that to begin with the music sounds great but it doesn't change throughout 95% of the game. Now this is a game whereby you can easily spend 20 plus hours trying to complete it and you're going to be listening to the same themes over and over. The songs are quite palatable but there isn't any variation. I should imagine that the system's limitations are the reason for this, as I reckon they couldn't sacrifice gameplay or graphics to fit much more music onto the cartridge. Overall though, I wouldn't let that put you off this game. My final thoughts are, although dated, the first Fire Emblem isn't a bad little game, and it's certainly worth a look today, even if simply to look at the franchise's roots to see which tropes have survived today to become staples of the series. Also, as you can see from this video, the original game now has a fan translation available online, meaning we all get to play the game for free without having to pay a billion dollar company even a bean. You should all thank me by redirecting your money you was going to spend on the game to my Patreon instead. That would be a much more wholesome cause, yeah. Although, if you want to experience a newer, snazzier version of the game, you could always check out the remake on the Nintendo DS, which saw releases worldwide. It is getting a bit on the pricey side these days though, so I would still advise emulation and a Patreon donation. I'm a poet and I didn't know it. Thank you for watching today's video, what was your first Fire Emblem game and which was your favourite? What other series origins would you like to see me talk about on this channel? Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to the channel as I release several videos every week and try to make at least one in-depth video too, at least once every 7 days. Shout out to Shizuka Kabayashi, David Mountford, Andrew Bazanski, Atanas Garcia, Edward O'Reilly, Peter Zadorn, Retail Archaeology and all of my other patrons. Thank you for your ongoing support. Yeah. If you want to be added to this prestigious list of people, then check out my Patreon page. Ta-ta and farewell.